and um, I put has visited a number of English and philosophy classes. Uh, the most memorable one for him was, of course, on the role of an author in seeing and representing a world, and the role of the reader in decoding the author's intent. Uh, Mehbood's dissertation was on cinematic perception, and he feels that this might be the reason why that particular discussion stuck with him. So, rooftops of Tehran, says Mehbood, could very much be a cause and effect novel at the macro level. For example, why people in the Middle East feel the way that they do about the US, or it could be a comparison and contrast novel for it deals with themes such as, um, and we, we can all uh, agree with and relate to this, universality of love, uh, friendship, growing up, as treated in this novel, rooftops, and the differences in the way people think of honor and uh, what's sacrificing, or what's worth sacrificing one's life for. Okay, and so this is now my spiel, um, and I, I haven't told you that, uh, my, my personal, a story about how I got to know Mahbod. So I read his book in 2011, and I have a colleague here who's also Persian. Um, uh, she's in my department, her name is uh, Persis Kareem. She told me that Mahbod was in fact local, and I could get in touch with him because he has a Facebook page, and so I wrote to him. That was way back in 2011, okay? And then I never heard back from him for a year and a half, and I thought, okay. <laughs> All right, one of those authors. Um, message because if you're on Facebook I know you guys have moved on sort of uh, you're not on Facebook anymore uh, but you have there's that other where, where you get the messages from people who are not your friends and uh, I guess he, he didn't know about that so when he finally figured out that there was an other section where people might have left messages he found that there were so many fans who had written to him and so he responded and it so happened that March was my daughter's birthday and she had read his book and Suddenly this idea came to me that I would give her a birthday present, a meeting with the author if he would agree, and he graciously agreed to meet with her. And so on her birthday we met, met both Sarwaji, and he signed her book for her, and since then we've been friends. Okay, so that, that was uh, my little story of how I got to know my poet. And uh, without further ado, I am going to give up the floor to my poet. Please let's give him a hand. How many of you actually have been on Facebook and know that, that the other mailbox exists? <laughs> For those of you who don't, the next time you're on your computer or laptop, I wasn't lying. There, if you, you can't see it on your mobile device, but if you go on your computer or your laptop and you open your messages, it says inbox and then there's the other. And I, well, first of all, I'm old, not the you other. Know, very savvy with technology. Second, I just never even thought that, that something like that would exist. So I ended up um, opening the messages, as, as uh, Ruby said, um, and found her message and quite a number of other ones uh, from a long time ago. She was the only one who actually returned my messages. I think everybody else was pissed off. They thought it was an arrogant jackass who doesn't return messages. And I'm very grateful. She has been incredible. Um, I'm going to make the, the, the talk piece of my, my presentation short and, and small so that we have a chance to dialogue. I'm very interested in hearing from you what you think of the book, what questions you have. And I might even ask you some questions as to how you felt about certain pieces uh, of, of the book. Okay? Can everybody hear me okay? Um, so normally uh, when I do these things, and, and I've done quite a number of these, uh, because a lot of universities pick this up, uh, and a lot of you in high schools have started picking it up, uh, I, I, I 
normally talk about why I wrote the book. And since this is a program, I'm a good sure I'm going to change the book and talk, spend more time um, talking about uh, the literary elements of the book, because I know that's what you, uh, the focus of your, your assignments are as well. Now, besides, Rui told me to do that. When Rui tells you to do something, you do it, or she'll give you an F. Uh, <laughs> So my, uh, you know, first of all, I, as Ruby said, just a little bit about me. Uh, I came to the States in 1976, as she said, when I was 19, so that makes me really old, probably older than most of your parents. Uh, I came here with the intention, as I say in the book, a uh, partial character, to get an engineering degree and go back in three years and give, because I didn't want, I hated engineering, I hated math, and my dad loved it. Thought that if you get an engineering degree from a U.S. company, uh, from a reputable uh, U.S. Uh, university, you have a wonderful life. So uh, my goal was to get the degree, take it home, give it to him, uh, and and then pursue my dream. It's funny. It's interesting. You know, parents are always practical and pragmatic about their kids. Few <coughs> kids want to go after the dream. The parents want to go about be as practical as they can be. And you know, that, that clash is kind of interesting. And in my era, you listened to your parents. You really respected what they said, and you tried to, to accommodate them as much as you can, which in my case was eight years of my life, practically. It took me five years to get an engineering degree, and then three years in high school, you have to declare in Iran. At that time, in my era, you had to declare a major, which I majored in mathematics, so that I could be prepared for engineering school. So my background was not in uh, literature in high school or in college, uh, and I. Uh, but but I think as I say in the interview section at the end of the book, I read Jack London's White Fang. How many of you have read that book? Good for you. If you haven't read it, it's a great book to read. I read that book when I was ten years old. I was sitting on the same rooftop uh, that's in the book, and I read that book, and I think from that moment on, literature became a major part of my life. Uh, even when I was studying for my math exams uh, or engineering exams in college, when I would take study breaks, I would go open up Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment or Brothers Karamazov for Emil Zola was another one of my very, very fam favorite uh, uh, writers when I was in college. Jack London, you know, Howard Fast, those guys were gods to me. I would, during those exam nights, I would go open those books up during study breaks and, and, and read those. And I could do that for 10 hours and not get, not get bored, but doing three ma mathematical uh, equations could just bore me to death. Sleep or smoke a say rather. I, I never <coughs> have a true approach. So, anyway, um, the, um, uh, so having um, not majored uh, in English or literature, um, but always wanting to be a writer, I have to educate myself on how I approach this. And I learned very early on. This may sound like a cliche, but it's true. If if you don't keep writing, if you don't practice, you, you don't become a good writer. You won't succeed. It's just like anything else. If you want to be a good basketball player, what do you do? You spend quite a number of hours in the gym. If you want to, if you want to be, uh, if you want, to, if you play an instrument, how do you get better? You gotta keep playing it. What is your passion? Whatever your passion is, think about it. The more you do it, the better you get at it. If you're a singer, the more you sing, the better you can carry out those notes. Writing is the same way, and I think you have to find a venues in which you can write, you can, you can get your emotions out, you can get your words out, you can think about what it is that you're writing so that you can, you can improve your skills in that, in that area. For me, you know, nowadays there are blogs, there are, you can go 
comment on other people's writings, you can write comments on their articles, and there's so many ways to do that. In my days, there weren't those things. So I started writing scripts, movie scripts, because I always thought of the, uh, the, the same thing that Jack Ryan's <coughs> wife Bang did for me. Um, Casablanca, the movie, did that for me for the movie. So I was always in love with movies. I'm still in love with movies. And I always think some, someday maybe I write a script, although I did write two scripts, which I didn't do anything with. But the reason I was writing the scripts was because the scripts, writing scripts teaches you certain things. Some of the things that you're probably exploring in the themes of the thesis that you're writing, um, such as, uh, you know, it, it teaches you how to take your what's in your mind, your imagination, and actually turn it into a concrete story. That's one thing. It teaches you how to create characters. It teaches you how to create plots, plot points, how to um, uh, um, take your story and make transitions. So those kinds of outlets are really important. The things that I felt I could carry over to, uh, to those skills I could carry over to um, my, my writing aspirations in terms of novels. The other thing I did to practice writing, by the way, uh, was, was uh, do a lot of Persian poetry. And I'll tell you why I did that, and it was truly intentional. The reason I did Persian, I did poetry, was because I think poetry is perhaps, uh, perhaps the most efficient way of writing. Every word means something special, and you have to be extremely stingy on what words you choose. There's all these there's a huge array of wor words, and you want to pick the one that specifically expresses exactly what you want to express. And the other thing poetry does is they sort of teach you how to get your emotions out. And getting that out is not an easy thing to do for a writer. Uh, and, and sometimes it comes across as, as weird. So learning how to express your emotions is a big part of writing. And I think poetry for me but, uh, enabled me to do that. Anyway, I, I, I got off track here a little bit, but, but practice, tr trust me, that you want to do that. You want to do it as much as you can. But one of the first decisions that you know, I as a writer had to make uh, and I'm sure, how many, I don't know how many of you have writing aspirations. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but if, if I see smiles, I'm sure some of you definitely are thinking about it. The, uh, one of the first questions is, is uh, what kind of a writer do you want to be? Uh, what you read in the book is put in there intentionally with quite a bit of thinking, quite a bit of thought that has gone through um, coming up with those uh, elements to be in the book. It took me three years, over three years, to write the book, and then probably another year revising it as I was going back and forth with my, with my agent, and my, my editors, etc. So about four years of your life goes into something like this. It's a very moving life, by the way, writing your, your, your family members, your, your social life basically gets destroyed because you do a lot of writing. But for me, that question of what, I, what kind of a writer do I want is was really interesting. And I remember I came across uh, this this quote that I always have with me. It's uh, by Franz Kafka, and uh, it, it, it says, "If the book doesn't wake us, as with a fist hammering on our skull, why do we need it? A book must be an ice uh, an ice axe breaking the ice inside us." And, and it, Give you an example of that. Um, I read um, the works of Edgar Allan Poe. How many of you have read Poe's stuff? Yeah. A lot of you. All of them have read that. Right. You read that, and uh, you read Stephen King. Okay. Both good writers. I mean, uh, nothing against Stephen King. I think when you read his writing, it's very fluid. It's exciting. It's page turner. It's uh, uh, it's incredibly entertaining if you're on a very long flight from here. Like I take a lot of long flights to to India, and you get very tired, and or Australia, and you're very tired, and you really want to just be entertained. Those are wonderful books to read. Right? It's 
nothing to get a sustainable candy. But you get a different sense of the book when you read his book versus what you read about Edgar Allan Poe, right? In Edgar Allan Poe. There's something here that you learn that you feel like you didn't know. There's a sense here that you, you develop a new perspective that you feel like you didn't know. That's really important. Now, Poe's stuff deals with death, with love, with afterlife, and those themes he obviously has picked, had picked intentionally in his books and explored them, right? So for me, it was um, kind, of, kind of important to choose, do I want to be a writer that's, who's purely entertaining, writes for entertainment only, or do I want to be considered a writer who has something to say and has a view on life? And for me, being having uh, my background, that latter realm uh, was really the one that I wanted to, to take. Uh, I wanted to make sure that when I talk to you guys, I say, did you get a new insight into life? Did you learn something you didn't know before, uh, when, when you read my book? Uh, and and, and did, do you see the world differently? Uh, and I think that's, that, that decision is, is, is obviously uh, really important. I reflected as I was trying to answer this question to myself as a, as a writer. I reflected on my own reading uh, experiences. And I thought of the books that I've read, like Mother's, The Mother of Maxim Gorky. And it taught quite a bit to me, quite, quite a lot to me about the impact of poverty uh, and inequality and unfairness on people's lives and what that could do potentially to people. And I think of some of my favorite books, like The Gadfly, a 19th century book that's not really, I don't think it's even in print right now, but you can probably find it in uh, used bookstores. Uh, that taught me quite a bit about mm, what uh, charity uh, can do to people, what kind of an impact it could have uh, on people's on people's lives, so I I wanted to be that that second kind of writer. Uh, but you know, as you sit down to write, there are other other issues that come up, and there are other decisions uh, from a literary perspective that you have to make. One of them is the choice of the voice. I remember very early on, very early on, as I was, I think I had written 60, pa 60 pages of this book, the very first draft. I had a friend who used to be a reader for Warner Brothers scripts. So I called him and I said, I'm writing this book. Uh, you know, I'm, 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 this weekend I'm doing nothing. What are you doing? He said, I'm doing nothing. I said, let's get drunk. I, I'm, I'm I said, let's, let's do some reading together. He said, OK. Came over and we spent the entire weekend talking about those first 60 pages. And one of the, he kept going at this on me, with me, going, what is this voice? I mean, you, it, this is a different voice. What are you trying to accomplish with it? Uh, and, and I kept saying, uh, the story is not the type of story that happens every day. Have you all read all of the book, or am I going to be ruining you? No, no, you've all read the book. So this stuff doesn't happen in every day. Some of it is unusual. And some people, in fact, have gone to book groups where some people say, I don't believe it. Okay, fine. But the majority of people do believe it. And I said, one of the things that I wanted to do with the voice was to ensure that this voice, this voice was trustworthy. This voice was authentic. This voice sounded sincere. And, and I think that's really, really important for you to choose that, that uh, that, that the, the voice that you want to tell the novel in to accomplish what you want it to do. Um, and you do that uh, but not by saying, well, Pasha is an authentic, trustworthy person, because then you're done. You know, <coughs> one, one line covers that whole thing. You literally, literally have to show it in the actions of the individual. You know, when literature te teachers tell you, show, don't tell, this is what they're talking about. So how do we learn, for example, 
that Pasha is is uh, authentic, believable, trustworthy. It's the fact that he deals, you know, how openly and sincerely he deals with the conflicts that he has inside of him. You know, he doesn't want to be an engineer, but his father does. And and he, as much as he hates, he says this, I hate mathematics, I hate engineering, but I love my father and I cannot disobey him. He says those exact words. And I remember because I was just reading the Persian translation of my book that just came out, and those words are fresh in my head. And or or the the, the sincerity with which he deals with the conflict that he has over loving Zayi and being a friend of Doctor. Right? He, he, that authenticity shows when he goes and plants a rose, a very dangerous act, exactly at the spot where Doctor's blood was spilled. The whole neighborhood knows that, right? So that authenticity comes out there. That authenticity comes out when, when uh, or trustworthiness, or that sense that this, this is a character who really cares about people around him comes out when Ahmed goes to find his brother or find his alley and announces to everybody that he's in love, which is big no-no in Iran. You can get your backside whipped for doing something like that, right? So Pasha shows up and wants to, to find, tells you a great deal about friendship and what he feels about friendship. And of course, we see him uh, reading writing, uh, we see him um, watching uh, classical movies. So that's how you create, you know, the voice that you need to create. Uh, you know, th that's what I mean by the voice. I mean, it gets, it, 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 it sort of goes into the character piece, which I will talk about a little bit uh, later as well. But, but, you know, you want that voice, you want, one of the things that we're doing um, at, at, as we were writing uh, as I was writing this book, and I was having my friends read it and provide feedback, just like I am with you in the second book, is to get that feedback, to go back in, uh, into the book, and to try to make the necessary changes that I needed to make. And one of the things that came out with was, okay, Pasha is a 17-year-old, if you want this, and he's telling the story, so if you want this voice to be believable, what you want to do is make him sound like a 17-year-old. Not, not like a 50-some-year-old man is writing the story of a 17-year-old. So I remember looking in the, in the thesaurus and finding the most, the, the, the simplest words I could find. I was putting some run-on sentences in here. And for that, almost some editors actually turned the book down and said, well, what kind of writing is that? Well, there were some smart ones who got it. That, oh, but that's the voice. This is what he's doing. So. You know, so you kind of be intentional about it, but it it it, uh, it, it, it could actually backfire in some uh, cases as well. All right, so uh, so that's that's my uh, my thing uh, on, on on the voice. The the other thing uh, is I think that the characters I I uh, I, I mentioned uh, the the characters I think is. Is another issue uh, that's really, really important as you get into writing something like this. Uh, if you notice, and since all you've all read the book, I, uh, this is really good. Uh, every single character is unique in some special way, right? Pasha is this book, book smart, uh, sort of idealistic. Um, kind of timid, in some ways, kid who has tremendously strong values. You know, he's kneeling with guilt over being in love with Zeddy. He always wants to do the right thing, to <coughs> listen to his parents. You know, Ahmed smokes cigarettes all the time, but he wants to smoke, but he doesn't smoke because he thinks his father would get mad. So Pasha is this, this character that always has the type of values that wants to always, uh, you know, do the right, the, the right thing, and we see that throughout uh, the book. Uh, that, and and Ahmed is exactly the opposite of that. Not that he would do the wrong things, but he would do what it takes for him to get what he desires. Right? Ahmed is a huge risk taker. Ahmed is a huge, uh, yeah, in, in in his own way, 
he goes for uh, what, he, what he wants and he helps Pasha uh, get what he wants. He's very smart, he's very pretty, he's very funny, um, and, and he, uh, uh, you know, even when everybody is upset, he becomes the center of attention to, to make people happy. Remember the measuring the width of the street, or after the Golisorhi trial, going back to make his family laugh, and etc. So that's that's. Um, I think that's the the other thing that you know in terms of the characters. One of my favorite characters in the book, to be honest with you, is Grandma, uh, and then because she is so stuck in the past with all those stories about grandpa that are not true. Re basically reconstructing the past, re recreating the past. And, and, and you see that theme, by the way, with the old people in the book. Grandpa, imagine Pasha's grandpa, think about that. He is also the same way, right? He's stuck in the past because he reads, he has a series of the year's worth of newspapers from the 1950s, 20 years earlier. And he wakes up every morning and he picks up one of them and reads them over, over, and over. He doesn't watch TV, he doesn't watch, he doesn't read the new news. He's constantly dealing with the old stuff. So he's stuck in the past. And his fascination with the clock. Do you remember that scene where he's, he's in, in there and the Pasha in their house, they have this grandfather clock that doesn't work. And he keeps staring at it. And at one point, Pasha says to him, oh, that clock is broken. He says, it's not broken. It just tells the wrong time. It's an in interesting uh, thing. So, so for me, this sense of nostalgia that's incredibly strong in the Persian culture, uh, in, and I think in the Middle East in general, in, in, in parts of uh, major parts of Eastern uh, culture, um, in America, we're very future oriented. We're always thinking about the future. In, in Cultures like mine, we're always thinking about the past. If we go to a nice place for vacation, we go, oh God, you know, remember when we went to such and such place, and this place just reminds us exactly of that. It's, we connect everything to the past, whereas here in the US, people connect everything to the future. So that element of the culture I was trying to portray through, the, through um, uh, grandma and grandpa, um, uh, yeah, you know, representing, representing those kinds of things. Or, uh, one of the other characters that really, really was, was incredibly important for me, and I took quite a bit of care writing about her, was Zanny. Uh, you know, she's a traditional woman, but she's, she's very daring, very curious, very brave. She's very observant. Uh, as you see, as she's writing, as she, she, she does pictures of drawings of the alley and of life and everything that's going on around her and tries to imagine what Pasha's faceless girl looks like, right? So uh, I, I wanted to set a, a character, to create a character was, that was principled enough, that stood up and... and made the ultimate sacrifice one would make as sacrifice as you, I don't know if you've noticed, and I, I'm noticing myself as I'm writing uh, more and more books, that the, the common themes in my writings are normally love, friendship, politics, and sacrifice. Um, the, the sacrifice is, is something that, you know, life has prepared Zari to make. There's uh, there are tools that I use to do that. For example, foreshadowing, there's a scene in which Zari talks about um, Socrates and, and talks about Golosurhi, the character in the book. And what did, what did Socrates do? Socrates basically said, my death will serve a much bigger purpose than my life. And when he had the chance to escape the prison, he didn't and took the poison and died because he thought that would be a making a much bigger statement. As then he asks Pasha when they're having ice cream, remember that, that senior there in the ice cream parlor, he says, well, what do you think about that? Do you think that's cowardly? 
So there's foreshadowing going on in the book to tell you what is coming up. Or the fact that there's so much emphasis, the whole chapter is set on, uh, uh, devoted to Bona uh, the Red Rose, the trial. Uh, and you should, by the way, uh, Google that. Uh, that's really important because sacrifice is a theme, major theme in my writings. You should Google that. You should watch that scene where I'm actually talking about Bona the Red Rose, the revolutionary who is accused of killing the, killing the Shah. You know, they broadcast his, uh, um, his trial, and he takes his jacket off, comes to the podium, he starts pounding on the, on, the, on the podium in front of him, and says, you, this, this court is uh, not a legitimate court, etc., etc. Right, exactly. <coughs> oh, yeah, you do it in Farsi. That's very good. Yeah. That's very good. Um, and, and Red Rose, and I mean, part of the reason, a lot of people actually just, uh, let, me, let me draw our attention here. A lot of people said, hmm, that Red Rose that's on the book, uh, that makes it like a romance novel. And I actually thought at, the, at first, too, and I tried to fight to get it off, but the publisher was right, and they kept pointing to this. I said, that's not the romance, that's, this is what that is. And they were right. They, they really were right, and, and I would never take that rose off the cover. Uh, but that rose represents this notion of sacrifice, because think about it, it's present throughout the book. It's the trial of Gorosofi. It's doctor sacrificing himself for the causes of the revolution. Uh, Pasha and Ahmed giving the girls roses. And then later on, Pasha planting that rose that until the very end of the book, it shows up again. Where everybody in the alley is taking care of it to, to, to remember what is, uh, what is uh, worth fighting for. I don't know if you recall at the end, in one of the, I think it's a couple of chapters before the very last chapter, where people are. Iraq is actually taking care of the red rose and watering it, and a couple of people come and come and help him. Uh, so the, the rose is always that that theme is always present. So if you're writing and you pick a theme, stick with it. It's really important that you stick with it, or it doesn't. It loses its value. It loses its meaning. It doesn't become obvious to the to the to the reader. But this notion of standing up and speaking out, I mean, it's, it's, it's again, it's another prevalent um, theme in the book. You see Ahmad doing it, standing up against traditions, old traditions. You see Feynman doing it by turning down her parents' request to marry somebody else. You see Pasha struggling with it, with um, not wanting to go to America or um, going against his belief that it's wrong to love um, um, the woman who's engaged to your, to your friend. And, and then later on, you see it in Pasha's father, when he is, you know, the sense of rebellion and standing up, when he goes to that military barrack where everything is just so structured and so stagnant, he becomes the rebel and goes around and starts breaking the windows. Remember, he's standing up. Remember that scene where, but, Engineer Sadiqi comes to arrest him, and he he knows he goes to jail, but he wants to fight. He tells the guy, "I'm gonna I'm gonna fight. I'm gonna kill you if you don't uh, let me prove basically my innocence." And remember, they go to this village. I mean, those are all kinds of things. If you pick themes, stick with them, put them in your characters. Don't make it necessarily obvious, but make sure that it's folded into what your characters do or say, etc. And use tools like, um, like foreshadowing that I just talked about, like with Socrates. Flashbacks, is, is, I'm, I'm learning in my writing, that, for example, flashbacks is a really in, important, effective tool that you create a question in the beginning. You literally are telling the end of the story or, 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 or putting the conflict right in the beginning of the story by that flashback and then hoping that your reader would go along and understand it. How many of you saw Breaking Bad? The popularity of that show is because it uses this flashback. The end of the film is actually in the beginning of the film. 
right? So you, uh, series, so you, you want to watch it to see how did we get to that ending, because if, if it's, especially if it's an intriguing ending, right? So that, that's, I think, um, that's, I think, is really, really uh, important. I already talked a little bit about uh, uh, the, the, the style uh, in terms of the words I chose, the characters I chose, etc. Uh, study style as much as you can. That's really important. Read authors who have different styles. Um, and every writer's, by the way, in some ways every writer's style changes from book to book. Uh, I've, I've noticed uh, I'm writing two other books simultaneously. Uh, one of them is, is completely finished. Um, I've noticed that my style changes with those. So your style has to accommodate the themes that you, the characters, the, the, the dialogue, all of those uh, kinds of things. Some of the other themes that I think are in the book, and I'll finish here in less than five minutes so that we have time for question and answers. Uh, the class was still working. Um, um, 10 Ten fifteen. Okay, so I'll finish in, in, in another three minutes, four minutes. Um, other themes that are in the book are the, the cultural cultural differences. You know, it's so funny because, like in Iran, mornings is, are very different than morning here in in the U.S. When you go to a funeral here, uh, everybody is very quiet. Everybody is very composed. Uh, you know, there's a there's a almost like a ritual that you go through. A uh, very organized ritual you go through, uh, people come and speak, etc. People are quiet. Very different, very vastly different in my culture. Uh, it's chaotic, people cry, people throw themselves in the, in the grave. And I wanted to show those, those differences, those cultural differences. And it's so funny because some, uh, some of the critics didn't get it. In fact, a, a, a few suggested, oh, he, he had made this so dramatic. What kind of crazy people act that way? You know? Okay, whatever. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, the, uh, and, and then the, the, another cultural theme, or, or political theme, was how you deal with authority. Uh, you know, we think here in the U.S. How many of you follow politics? Not many of you, huh? Literature majors. They're not all literature majors. No, no. Okay. Few of them. All right. Um, well, so the, it's interesting. Uh, the, uh, you know, we think just because we have a system of democracy here, we're going to send these wonderful, like Mr. Smith goes to Washington type people to Washington. And the reality can't be just because the system is the correct system, it doesn't necessarily produce the right results and send the right people to to Washington. Uh, it's the same, uh, I think, in. Iran, it's it, 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 the, how you deal with authority is very, very different uh, there than how you deal with them here. And I wanted to make that a, a, a big part of uh, the book in terms of what's considered fair, what's fairness. Um, you know, you recall that scene where Paul Sophie says this, this court is a is, is a circus. The father says. In this country, you're guilty until you prove yourself innocent. Uh, you know, all of the things uh, that, that, that happen in there, uh, uh, yeah, I, I think, so I think, anyway, I, I, so authority, I think, dealing with authority is a major thing. But the most, the, 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 the most, uh, and again, I, I mean, this is a discovery for, for myself, uh, even a revelation for myself recently, is that it seems like honor, sacrifice, Friendship, love, politics are the main themes that I constantly want to be aware. So I'll, uh, I'll stop. Uh, and I'm sure you have questions. I'll be more than happy to answer any questions you have. Um, I'll right, absolutely stay and sign books for you as well. Yes. Um, go ahead. Have yes. I uh, was just saying that the theme is uh, the value of time. I know a doctor talks about that and how it's the most important commodity. And I think over the course of the book, you see, like, Pasha especially, really realize the importance of it. 
Right. No, absolutely. I, mean, I think it comes up very early on in, in the book. And the um, doctor asks, well, what do you think is the most, I think, precious commodity, because that's what puts it that way, I think. And, uh, of course, Pasha immediately says, life. And he says, no, it's time. And then he goes on to say, proceeds to say, well, time, it's time to do what hasn't been done. It's time to take action. Um, what's interesting is that I think later on, uh, Pasha, when he finally finds the courage to go visit his grave again, uh, he says, Dr. we were both wrong. It's not time, it's that that's the most important, the, the most precious commodity we possess as human beings. You have that, my dad has that, Ahmed has that, even Elash has that. You know. So that's uh, interesting, but very good point, excellent point. And I think the notion of time is played through the book. I mean, with all the flashbacks going back and forth, that's obviously one technique that I try to, to use to play with time. The other thing is that the grandfather thought that's broken. The, parent, the, the, the grandparents being stuck in the past. Uh, you know, all of those things. I was thinking like time specifically, how your kind of perception changes where, you know, at the beginning he's, uh, I don't know, he's a kid, he thinks he's all the time in the world, and then once like Dr. Pat like dies, and then, you know, you think there he dies, his like actions turn from just kind of like being an idealist to like action. So yes. I was wondering if that's different than what else you said about time, if they're like almost two different. Yeah, so, it, so it's, it's, that's a very great observation. I and mean, one of the things we tried to do was, uh, and I even talk, remember talking to my editor at Penguin about this, was that what we wanted to do was for the voice to mature as the character matures. So the voice actually changes throughout the book. I don't know if you know this, but it's, it's much more simplistic in the beginning. As it goes on, it becomes a bit more mature. Uh, and, and that's, it, when you are put through a life like that, when you have people you love taken away from you by force or by, you know, the authorities, you become the kind of individual who, you know, your, your, your life changes, your, the, what you do changes. And for him, he, at one point, I think he says, I'm counting every second. He says, at one point, he says, Again, I remember this because I just read the, the, the Persian uh, uh, translation. He, he says, Life, time is precious uh, when it goes really fast. And it becomes a real drag when it slows down. And his life is, at that point, very slow because he's stuck in his past. He's stuck in, in, in loving Zari and wondering why that has happened. Wondering what he could have done differently if he could have. I mean, we have these these thoughts of him constantly going back to that rooftop. He has dreams about it, and sitting down before the agent with the radio sees him, right? So there's all these, again, to your point, all, all, all these uh, uh, things I do with time, um, with these different characters. To, to make that exactly what you said um, important and stand out. Because again, when you pick a thing, stick with it in writing. Writing is hard. Imagine if you're writing a three, four, five page paper, how difficult it is. Now think if it, it's three, four hundred pages, it's hundred times more difficult. Uh, so you just kind of remember the thing. Somebody was, so I've never read Harry Potter, um, but a daughter of a friend of mine is very, very, Excellent, very intelligent. And she was telling me, wow, I've read, she said she had read all six, ten, or twelve, or what, volumes. <laughs> there it is. And she said, I couldn't believe the mind of this writer that something she had said in page 33 of the first volume actually becomes an issue again and again and again in the very last uh, version that came out. And, and that's good writers do. Good writers remember exactly the main points that they want to make and stick with them. Yes? I have a question. Um, how real is the book and the characters in oh, the book? I knew you were going to That was coming. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, so 
the, the I mean, if you look at the, the cover, it says uh, Mabo Taraji, I think, it, and it says a novel, right? And then Rostov said that one. So it's a novel. I mean, I, I want it to be considered a novel. But I would also tell you that uh, uh, in some cases I didn't even change the name of the people who were in the book. Like, very, Ahmed was my last one, and his name is Ahmed. Um, he married Faina. Uh, there was a Zari who was next door to me. The doctor was based on three characters. And when the book was chosen for the Broward College, um, one book program, uh, they invited me for a two day event there. I went and gave speeches. And it was really interesting. After I returned, this, uh, the, the president of the university called and said, There's a gentleman, one of our professors, Iran, he's Iranian, he's sitting here. He says he didn't know that you were coming to college. He was on vacation when you came. He didn't know you were coming to college, but he came back, he saw all the posters, the announcements, etc. And he swears he's the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, is his name, and I, I since it's being recorded, and it will be posted, I will mention the name. But I, said, I said, is this the name? And he said, oh, yes. I said, yes, he's actually one third of the character, and he got on the phone and he started crying, <laughs> very emotional. And he said, you didn't really go after my girlfriend, did you? I said, come on, you married her. <laughs> <laughs> so, the some of the characters, yes. I mean, uh, I mean, a lot of what happened in the book, it's either from my life or what happened around me. Um, not necessarily, I mean, think about it. If you were to write about your own life, you wouldn't get the the, uh, the dialogues right, the jokes right, so a lot of those are obviously made up. Um, but, um, and do, do you recall what happened when this guy wrote this um, supposedly autobiography and then got an uh, Oprah show and yeah. got destroyed? They said, you, will, you should we make this autobiography? I said, I'm so scared of Oprah, no way. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about Amber. Uh, Ahmed is an uh, uh, amazing, amazing uh, man, uh, exactly as I describe him in the book. I mean, he just was not, I did not exaggerate this character. I did not rebuild his character. He was who I portrayed in the book. Um, I, I lost track of him. He got married uh, to the woman in the book, and, and I um, lost track of him after about three, four, four years of being in the U.S. Uh, I didn't go back to Iran, by the way, for almost 17 years, I think. Okay. So I hadn't seen my father for 17 years. And, and I remember I went back, and my father was in the hospital. But that, that, actually, no, that's not true. The, the actual chronology, chronology was this way. I went back, the first couple of times, I couldn't find him, for whatever reason, or it didn't, didn't, if something happened, I couldn't see him. And he didn't know I was back. I didn't know where he lived anymore. Um, one of the times my father was sick, was in the hospital. I went to the hospital, saw my dad. I mean, I landed in the vehicle, went to my dad, to, to the hospital, saw my dad. And then my dad fell asleep. And I thought, OK, I don't want to sleep in the middle of the day because of the jet lag and all that. I'm going to stay up until I thought, oh, I'll, I'll rent a car or, or get a driver. Uh, very easy to get, like, rent a driver in Iran for the whole day. It's extremely inexpensive. Uh, and have him drive me to the old neighborhood because my parents had moved away from that neighborhood. I went there and found his door and noticed that you know, something really funny, that the codes for secret codes for most of my, my passports and things like that always have 7-7 seven, seven in them. And I didn't know why. And I realized when I got there that, oh, our, our, our um, the address was actually 77 whatever. Okay, so that's 77 that stuck with me. I rang the bell and this guy comes out with beard and everything. And he looks at me, he goes, oh my god, no, you know, I, we're talking about many, many years has passed. I used to have hair. <laughs> I tell everybody I used to be six foot four and really good looking. 
This kid still recognized me. It was Abilene, the kid who says to my father, ring the bell, and then he says, okay, now let's run. Oh, uh, it, was, it was him, and he hugged me, he said, oh, uh, Uncle Mabu, it's so good to see you. You know, in Iran, you, you know, if you're older, they call you Uncle So good to see you, so, I, oh my God, I, how did you recognize me? And then he introduced himself. And he said, well, Abu doesn't live here anymore. He's, uh, he has his own home and etc. Uh, and I said, okay, well, I, I went inside, talked to them a little bit, and, and then I said, okay, I'm going to go back to the hospital. Uh, here's my cell phone number. Make sure Ahmed calls me. I said, okay. And so I go back, I drive back to the hospital. I walk into my father's room. The windows are all closed. The shades are closed. And my dad's asleep. And I see this old, haggard-looking man walking back and forth like this. went up there and I said, hi, my name is Mahmoud Siraj, you know, Mr. Siraj's son. And this guy just burst into tears and hugged me and started crying and kissing me. And he said, where have you been? Where have you been? And I pulled him back and I saw Ahmed's features. I recognized them. It was Ahmed. And I, I, I lost, I mean, you know, I'm getting emotional when I'm talking about it right now. And, and we, we walked downstairs. And we went and sat on the hospital steps, which was in, like in this like garden-like thingy. And, and we sat there and we talked for hours. And he told me about what had happened in his life. He had a very hard life. Uh, the, the woman uh, he had married him uh, passed away a few years earlier. We asked him, how was my day? And he just looked at me and said, we don't know, do we? And I said, no. I don't know. She, she had breast cancer and she passed away a few years ago. And that destroyed him. Uh, and so we've, it's interesting, um, we spend <coughs> probably, I was literally for I think five days or so, we spend every minute together, but I think I wanted to remember him the way he was, and I think he wanted to remember me the way I was, and, and I had changed, he had changed, and although I still had his number, uh, although every once in a while his daughter actually calls me, uh, we, uh, we had, uh, not that in touch. And I remember we went to his house and, and I said, let's go up on the rooftop. But life in Iran has changed. People don't go to rooftops anymore because rooftops is a symbol of being in openness. You know, it's, it's a symbol of you know, that freedom that you feel in, in individually, the, the social freedom that you have. You're up there, everybody can see you, you can see everybody. Life is not like that in Iran anymore. Life is very private. People don't go on the rooftops. And, make themselves visible. And, and he looked at me when I said, let's go up on the rooftop. He said, why? And I looked at him, and he looked at me, and I think we both all of a sudden realized what was going on. He said, oh, okay, 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 okay let's, let's go. And I went up there, I actually took some pictures of it, that didn't turn out very well. What <laughs> but, um, but, but it was very interesting. It's very, very interesting. It was very interesting to look into your old house where you grew up. Somebody else lives there now. Anyway, that's my story. Huh? Yes, did he ever read the book? Uh, well, no. At that time, the book was just coming out, and I told him, because when since the book has come out, I have an uncle in 2009. Uh, and I told him that I had written uh, a book and that he was the main character in the book. And he said, I only have one request. And he was driving, and never forget this. He said, I only have one request. I said, what is it? He said, please, I beg you, make me look like Robert Redford. <laughs> <laughs> I said, look, you're much better looking than Robert Redford. Are you kidding? Yes. Uh, when you were drafting his story, did you intend for Zari to die the way she did initially, or was that something that sort of developed and you thought would be more impactful? Um, so the ending is an interesting, uh, right. interesting uh, choice there. I mean, the, the other choice you will have to always make is how do you finish your book. Uh, I struggled with that ending quite a bit. It took me a long time to write the ending, and I wrote three different versions of the ending. And the first two, uh, the other two, uh, she dies in those. And anybody who read the 
those versions and said, don't use it. It is so hopeless. It, you read it and it, it doesn't, it doesn't make life sound hopeful. Uh, which is one of the things I wanted to do, say there is hope. You know, there is hope. There is, you know, things don't die. Some people have criticized the ending and said, oh, it's too Hollywood. I, I didn't even think my book was going to get published, let alone become a film. Uh, and it had nothing to do with wanting to be Hollywoodish, but it had everything to do with, uh, with hope and with, with life goes on. Uh, despite all of the terrible, horrible, horrible, horrible things that happen, life goes on. And I, I decided to, ch to end the book on that scene where the two of them are looking at the same star and saying, that's you, or no, that's you, okay, that's us. Um, and now, I, I, I tell you, it, it, the open, it's a little open-ended, which many people are, are maybe 10,000 emails from readers and half of them uh, say, hey, we want a sequel. And, and I think that ending allows for that, which I'm, I'm glad, and I think at some point I will probably a sequel to, to Roof House. Uh, it'd be good to see what happens to those characters. So yeah, I did different endings, but everybody said stay away from the from the ones that, that she dies. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, it was How many of you did think that she had died? Wait, yeah. that, that she had died when, she, oh, when you read that scene about So many of you thought that Master Angel was that? So I'm putting a lot of tips in there to, to yeah. make sure that you think maybe her. So that, that's another. Yeah, I see that you're making it very suspenseful because just when you would think that it is her, you find out that it isn't her. Right. And then you'd say, okay, it isn't her, and then you find out, okay, it is her. Right. So you want to put those hooks in there. And I wanted to put those tips in there. I, mean, I could have just gone without mentioning Math Angel and just having him come across her a couple of times. But I put tips in there that, wow, you need to find out. Some people find that. Off-putting. I mean, I, even some critics said, "Well, I figured it out." Well, okay, <laughs> <laughs> but they solved the, the Einstein's relativity, uh, you know, problem. Uh, so, yeah, I put all the scenes in there for you to find out. That's not the point of writing literature. Where they're like, "Okay, so if I know the ending, I'm not going to read it." Okay, let's not read history because we need to know the ending. Yes. <laughs> That's the other thing. If you ever write, please notice that. Please notice that. Uh, and I know it's going to uh, get published somewhere or, or posted somewhere. But there are a lot of idiots in the in the uh, in the publishing world, uh, in, the, in the world of critics. There are many, many of them are truly idiots. And that's no, right to, no right to be judging books or doing. Books. Like when you put your work out there, that's it. That's that's. Who uh, you know you're dealing with those people, and you just have to. I don't even read the news anymore. I used to in the beginning. I would read it. I would send it to my editors. I think my editor was getting pissed off at me because I was sending her so many of these. I'm finally said, "Please stop sending these to me. I know it's work. The book is good." Um, <laughs> but um, the, you know, when you see these reviews, they're like, "Ah, oh, what kind of people behave that way when they go to funerals?" Okay. You know, you know, please get out of Oskaloosa, Iowa. <laughs> I'm from Iowa. I've lived in Iowa. I love Iowa. It's my favorite state. You need to know that. So that's why I use that. I always use it. Um, so you came from a technical background, even not by choice, but you were doing engineering through high school and for your first part of college. Do you think uh, doing all that technical writing hurt or helped you become a writer of a novel? I, I didn't do any technical writing. Uh, that, that wasn't my job, no. My job is very different. Uh, I, uh, professionally, I do a lot of coaching of executives. Uh, so I, do, I don't do any technical writing at all. Well, I mean, like when you were going through college, you didn't have to? No, not really, not really. Uh, no, I don't, the, really the, what helped me was writing those scripts and writing poetry. And I spent probably two years of my, write, my life, and my dad is very upset because she, he thinks I should have continued with that. I said, yeah, you thought I should be an engineer. Um, but he thinks I should have continued writing in, in Persian. Uh, but it just wasn't what I wanted to do. I wanted to write in English. I wanted to, 
I, I, I think it was the right decision given the, you know, it's a tenth ranking now, it's still selling, still thanks to support of uh, people like Ruby. Uh, uh, it, it's been translated, I think, 15 to 20. I don't know how many back now, many now uh, languages. So it's, I get so many emails from, I think it's uh, best selling in Russia, uh, Italy, Turkey. Uh, those are the places where I get a lot of emails from. Somebody else had a question. Okay. Um, two, two more questions. questions. Um, did you ever consider writing the story from Ahmed's point of view? No. I do I would tell you what I thought about switching the rules. So some of that humor coming from Pasha. Because it is eventually it's my I mean I'm writing it, but it's my my humor, right? Uh, although it's based on Ahmed. Um, but I didn't think it would work. Uh, there's so much pain associated with my Pasha's life. There's so much emotions. There's, there's so much subtleties that he has to see through that I didn't think that would work through Ahmed's uh, viewpoint. Ahmed would dismiss a lot of these things. And it, looks like it wouldn't be in, in keeping with his character if he had to make those observations about time, you know, about grandpa, about grandma, about uh, you know, all of the things, that, uh, some of the themes, political themes, because Ahmed is not a reader. Ahmed is not following the news, you know. Mostly what he cares about is getting fame. So it wouldn't have worked uh, from that perspective. Now, I did think about doing some of the humor on the other side, and it, it originally, uh, a couple of the comments I got from the readers was that Pasha is less interesting than Ahmed, and is that going to work against the book? I always believed that it wouldn't. Uh, and, and I always thought of it, you know, that, to me, I would never, you know, it's part of Pasha's life is based on me, you know. I'll be the, the best friend of the hero, I'm not necessarily the hero. I would never get the girl, because my wife would kill me. <laughs> so. so what happened to Zay? What happened to what? Zay. Oh, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> <laughs> Are you taking this? I mean, Seth is going right. to kill me. <laughs> I mean, you had a question. Yeah, I, I thought, what was the purpose of the masked angel um, with the character? Like, because it's very mysterious and distorted, and he has a lot of um, power, like, the effect she has in the story is like very powerful, so what was the purpose of that character? Very good question. Very, very good question. So, um, if you notice, there's a scene uh, where Mr. M Mrs. Mehrbon is talking about Mr. Mehrbon being in jail. Remember, this is the character who was in jail for 18 years, and he was arrested on the night of his wedding and was kept in jail for 18 years. Remember that character? Uh, and there's this one scene where, where Mr. Mehrbon is saying, Mrs. Mehrbon is saying, her husband was complaining about th this new wave of political prisoners who have, who believe in political dogmas and who have become, the, 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 who believe in religious dogmas and, and were mixing politics and religion. So the last angel sort of represented to me what was, I think, in those times. Nobody in Iran, by the way, wears burqas. Um, uh, there are few locations where you would go where you would find that. So I wanted to represent that mysterious character as, as what was coming. It, in fact, a, a number of Iranian um, uh, uh, critics have pointed that out, that this is a sign of things to come, the, the Islamic Republic, uh, and, and the mass angel in some ways represents that future. Uh, although we never really see him with, see her with Pasha, so the people who criticize it, uh, I say, we never see them together. Uh, it's, it's, it's a symbolic figure. And it's not that anybody wears burqas in Iran, not really. I didn't realize that that 
clock goes behind, and so we have a few minutes left, and so uh, let's let's get the offer on hand.